All right, my name is Tim Zafal Wolfhemi, and I'm from the Security and Privacy Research Lab at the University of Washington. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about the experimental security analysis of non network compact fluorescent lamps um, in the context of compromised home automation systems. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with the UCOM lab at the University of Washington as well. So, the abstract from my talk will be um, we we're basically trying to investigate the feasibility of course and physical harm uh, through the explosion of compa compact fluorescent lamps uh, to home occupants via an exploded home automation system. And to help us get a scope on this talk, uh, the problem or the questions we're trying to answer are, you know, what physical harm can an attacker inflict on the home occupants, right? Um, and in particular, with the focusing on devices with non-network capabilities like CFLs. Um, and in using CFLs and a compromised home automation system, is it possible to remotely start fires, or seizures, or expose home occupants to mercury and shattered glass? These are questions we'll try to answer. Uh, a brief background on home automation um, systems. Uh, I have a, I don't know if I have a laser pointer. But I have a plan. It's right there in front of you. Oh, okay, great. I have a plan of a house here. All right. I have a plan of a house here. Um, and to the core, the core of the system has to do with the controller itself. Um, you have several examples where you have uh, mesh networks uh, with several sensor nodes deployed around the home. And some of them act as uh, repeaters and delivering packets to distant nodes. Uh, so. With the controller itself, you, you could have uh, door locks, you could have uh, dimmers, you could have uh, thermostats or HVAC systems connected to this home automation controllers that provide remote, couple of, um, remote connections over the internet so that users can conveniently, or homeowners can conveniently control appliances in the house over the internet. Uh, home automation systems, just to add to, to this, home automation systems also like uh, work seamlessly with with, uh, with uh, fire alarms and, and, and the likes to uh, detect intrusions and, uh, and um, you know, fire, just in, just, a, just, in the, just in the bed, there's, uh, there's something, something of that sort. So for the projected market growth, um, we're all familiar with the Nest system. How many people know about the Nest thermal start? All right, great. Uh, it's expected to grow at a compound rate of 33% from around 2.3 billion US dollars in 2010 to nearly 9.5 billion US dollars in 2015. Um, this is from the Berg Insight. Um, they also have, you know, they also have numbers uh, telling telling you how much connection internet of uh, internet connections or uh, you know, that would be uh, that would increase as a result of our home automation systems. So what were some of the remote compromising capabilities that we're able to accomplish with the systems? Uh, just to give you uh, an insight, we, we purchased two, two brands of zero-wave home automation systems. And for confidentiality purposes, we would just tag them as products A and B. Uh, we also bought a bunch of sensors around the house to simulate in an actual deployment in the home. And some of the sensors were, or, or actuators were light switches and dimmers door locks, thermostats, IP cameras, and the likes. So uh, both products were very similar in, in, in their features. Uh, they both have a web, a web interface uh, to allow users to uh, control appliances remotely. Uh, they also had remote capabilities to control over the internet appliances. Uh, the only difference was with the ZLIV module that they had, one was uh, integrated in the device, the other required a dongle that you had to buy separately. So for the vulnerabilities that we discovered with these systems and actually exploited, uh, we noticed that product A had, uh, was susceptible to cross-site scripting attacks. Um, we were able to embed JavaScript code to add a fictitious user. Uh, with admin privileges while ensuring um, the stealthiness of our of our attacks on the systems. Uh, with this way, we had direct access to the control panel to turn on lights, light switches remotely over the internet. We could turn up, turn on up. Uh, could, we could also control HVAC systems to support hungry devices. Uh, we could uh, we could unlock doors. Uh, we could do whatever we wanted to do with the home automation system. 
Uh, the other thing was with insecure HTTP, where if you were on the same network with the with the homeowner, uh, you could capture packets or eavesdrop some eavesdrop on them packets, uh, credentials, and extract credentials, login credentials, uh, which would enable you to get access to the system at a later time or instantly. Uh, the other thing with uh, product A was, uh, product A was very um, prone to a lot of attacks, as you can tell. Uh, it had a uh, VNC server with uh, running on a high numbered port. The issue with that was they had a default password of admin, and if you were like uh, due to yourself, uh, like myself, um, and non-technical, uh, you may not know, you may not be aware of the fact that uh, you had a VNC server running on that, and so you could get direct, an attack, you could get direct access to the system and control whatever they wanted to do. Uh, product B, on the other hand, was uh, found that it used the uh, insecure cookies. Uh, they they did not attach any expiration time or date to it. Um, if you know what the the cookie value was you could just add it to your browser and add you know complete access to the control panel itself without login. Um, so what are the implications of these vulnerabilities? Um, an attacker can remotely control appliances and actuators in the home. This has been shown by uh, uh, Fuladi and others. Uh, they just uh, published work in Black Hat. Uh, they were able to you know control light dimmers, switching HVAC systems, alarm systems, door locks. Will also did the same thing, uh, except that the attack vector was different. They did uh, they used they actually compromised the zero protocol stack. Uh, the other thing is um, an attacker can view um, feeds of webcams without the homeowner's consent. This is especially creepy uh, if you <laughs> if you think about having kids and you know putting nanny cams and in their rooms and, and the likes. So that's that's very. Uh, it was very insecure in this regard. Uh, but the important part of our talk, I think, of my talk today is non-network appliances like CFLs are not exempt from an attacker's manipulations, right? Um, if, you, if you take a moment back and think about it, uh, manufacturers of these appliances do not think about, you know, users using um, devices like this in this context where you can remotely manipulate them. and we. We, we do believe that manufacturers do not test ex extensively, you know, uh, these scenarios uh, of operation, and, and, and it's more likely for an attacker to, you know, leverage this and, and uh, push the limits of the operations to, to, to regions that have not been tested against. So why would an attacker choose uh, CFLs? It's cheap, it's, uh, it's, a, it's out there, everybody is switching to CFLs these days. Uh, incandescent lamps have been phased out uh, for CFLs due to their energy efficiency. Um, this increases the pool of possible attack you know, uh, targets that an attacker could go after. Uh, the other thing is CFLs have more potentially vulnerable complex circuitry than regular incandescent bulbs. They do have, uh, they have electronic ballast for regulating the amount of current flowing through the CFL itself. Uh, there's a good chance that uh, we could push the, uh, the operating the operating points beyond what has been tested against uh, with our attack scenarios. Uh, the other important point is standard CFLs are not to be used with light dimmers as they may trigger fires. There have been instances of this in the news. Um, I will make some core assumptions or core setup uh, later in the, in the next slide as to why this may be a problem. Um, the other issue is most CFLs contain about three to five milligrams of mercury as the uh, potential source of harm for uh, the home occupant. So our core assumption is the home the homeowner has ill advisedly connected a non dimmable CFL to a remotely controllable home automation dimmer. Right? Um, again keep in mind uh, the fire the Fire departments issued warnings that people should not use standard CFLs uh, with dimmers. But people may choose to ignorantly uh, ignore this or stubbornly do so. Uh, and we've seen instances of this that have caused fires uh, in, in homes. So, what was our approach and method? Uh, to start out the experiment, we needed to ensure our safety. Uh, 
again, I, I like that the wrists, fire, glass, um, uh, mercury, right? So we needed to anticipate and be adequately prepared for the hazardous materials. Uh, and we set out to do this by uh, using this structure, the plexiglass structure that we designed and we thought it to, you know, keep us from any, um, any shattered glass that may, might have resulted from our experiments. Um, as it turns out, this is not an, this is not an effective way to uh, keep us safe from mercury exposure in the event that that happens. So we took a step back and talked to people in the department, and we were uh, lucky to have people, um, a, lab that, a wet lab that was designed for this purpose to properly contain mercury and dispose of uh, mercury in the event that it's leaked. So they gave us this uh, glove box, which did just that. It was well ventilated. Uh, and we proceeded to do all our experiments in that. And keep in mind, we are EE and CS majors. And we had to get expert advice. Yeah. Uh, uh, Nate from IU, question. If on a shattered glass, because you're, uh, you're looking at sort of like a bio-sealed environment with a right. box, uh, were there precautions taken to make sure the gloves did not get uh, compromised because of shattered glass? Right, right. You know? um, yes, we, so we did a couple of other experiments right, before, you know, just playing with the lamps itself. Um, and, and we 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 ensured that the the region that the latex gloves were well covered just in case something something of that sort happened. Um, yeah. Thank you. So the glove box was, you know, provided that that insulation or, you know, that protection from those dangerous materials. We also have a fire extinguisher just in case. Um, so we also wanted to know how much current, how much current was flowing through the lamp itself. We um, wanted to see abnormalities and and the the signals we were generating and what effects they had on the CFLs. And to help us do this, we had a fidget current sensor that acquires uh, the root mean square value of the current through the CFL in real, in real time. Also used the interface key, which captures 1.5 samples per second. Uh, well, we also wrote uh, a real-time plotting tool in .NET uh, just to help us visualize, you know, how much current was flowing through it. And this is what it looked like. It was pretty basic. Uh, the time is in milliseconds, and we have the current apps. So, signal generation. What did we do to generate the signals? Um, we utilized the OpenZWave.NET libraries uh, to write a bunch of scripts to generate our signals. We did not perform an end-to-end -end, uh, test over the internet, uh, as that wasn't the focus of our, of our work. We wanted to see what kind of signals could, have, could be applied to CFLs accustomed custom to pop or catch fires or release mercury. Right? Uh, we also used the ANZ stick static update controller shown there uh, in the picture uh, beside it. And as an integrated Z-Wave module. So for the signal types, um, we had uh, four signals. Uh, signal A was a, a train of periodic triangular pulses that basically simulated an individual turning the dial of a dimmer all up to the maximum and down to the minimum at a fixed rate. So it was periodic in that regard. Um, we played around with the levels and figured that it was more effective to have the levels somewhere close to the onset of visual fluctuations of the lamp to cause it to quick to fill quickly. Um, the other one was with uh, periodic pure, periodic rectangular pulses. Well, we're basically just toggling toggling the CFL on and off at a very fast rate. I'll talk more about the signal later. Question. Is there anything for physics behind those waveforms and those? So, for signal A, for signal A, we just. I mean, there's those, like, those signals have caused failures in other pipes. Right. So, I, I mean, I, I think we went off of the assumption that if you if you toggle something on and off at a fast rate, you're going to, at, at the simplest case, you're going to reduce the lifetime of the product, right? We're going to see what variants could we, you know, come up with that could cost more harm uh, through the CFL itself. Uh, I think we just went up with that and came up with variants. Um, thank you. So, so, 
follow-up question? Yes. I lost the train. Are these signals to the controller, or is this what the power looks like going? Into? No, this this is to the the Z-Wave demo. We just altering the demo level. Um, so you have a range of zero to hundred, and you can vary the signal, the the level based on the the Z-Wave demo. So that's the signal to the dimmer. Right. And that's not what the power output looks like. That's probably. not what it looks like. I will show you that. I'll show you a video of that later. So signal C, uh, we wanted to introduce some randomness to all of it, right? Um, what we did was use a random number generator with a Gaussian distribution. And we basically com comp compared it to a threshold. And based on if it was higher than a threshold or not, we would increase the DEMA level um, on the CFL. Uh, and then the last signal we applied was uh, signal D, which is a combination of signal A and signal C. Uh, what we did was. Uh, for the normal operation, we had the generation of signal A, and then we randomly generated current spikes uh, uh, based on some random number generator, uh, just to introduce you know random burst of uh, uh, of current flowing through the CFO. <coughs> and lots of other but there are lots of possible you know uh, signals that you could generate. Think of you know playing with the threshold uh, and and seeing what effect it has on the signal. Like you said. Um, the level for signal A was chosen to to introduce an offset um, to 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 was introduced at the onset of like, visual fluctuations in the lamp itself. Um, we've not explored a wide <laughs> wider range of uh, possible signals that you could generate. Did you have a question? I better right. for the end. All right, cool. All right. So just to explain signal D, uh, the generation of signal D. We had like an initialization sequence, and then we went ahead to generate a random number. And based on the random number, uh, we compared it to a threshold. And if it happened to be uh, less than the threshold, we would go on with the, uh, with the generation of signal A. And we just repeat that cycle over. Now, in the event, in the event that the random number that was generated was greater than the threshold, would proceed to uh, to generate another random number to to denote the duration of the spike, the current spike, right? And we would set the DEMA level to maximum during that, that duration. Um, and then at the end of, and they would periodically check it and say, oh, has the current duration expired? And if it's expired, would we would regenerate a new number and just go around the cycle of the loop. And if it hasn't, we just set the DEMA level to a maximum level. So that's, in a nutshell, our, our signal D. Uh, work. So I have a video here uh, for the actual voltage across the CFL um, during the course of our experiments. Uh, this is an oscilloscope with uh, uh, showing uh, two and a half, two and a half cycles at at, at sixty hertz. Uh, the trigo set to sixty hertz, uh, um, and we'll see the effect in just a second. And uh, that's the y, y the y axis is in, as a, the vol, the voltage while the x axis is the time. <coughs> okay. So this is with signal A. It consists of pulse width modu modulated signal, and over time, as I were increasing the pulse width at a fixed rate, uh, and uh, it's like we're ramping it up to the maximum and to the, and to the minimum. So it increases the pulse width and decreases it at the same time. For demonstration purposes, we replace the, uh, the CFL with a, an incandescent ball, uh, just, just to be safe. Uh, and you can see the effect. And that's the that's a Z-Wave uh, dimmer. So you can see the pulse would increase and decrease. Uh, that was just the operation for, for signal A. Now, if you connected this to an actual CFL, you'd see it fluctuate um, at some unsteady state. Okay. Did you did you put uh, what, uh, some some calibrator here because the voltage across two right. volts, four volts, and yes. Not what we did, what we did was we used a step-down uh, transformer uh, to decouple the the oscilloscope from the actual uh, CFL. 
I'm not going to show signal B because uh, as we found out, it, it may induce seizures. Uh, and for safety reasons, I'll not show that. Uh, for signal D, uh, Uh, that's the current monitor, by the way. You can see random spikes in the, in the current monitor. Uh, what we're basically doing is go ahead and generate signal A for the normal operation, and then randomly ramp up the current through it. Uh, and you would see from from the oscilloscope, uh, this is like the normal, and, and you can see like the in, run, rapidly increase uh, increase pulse width. Uh, but the normal region is around this region where I'm just ramping up the current to a fixed level uh, for signal A. And then you'd have occasional uh, increases in the pulse width of the signal. So yeah. for signal B, how did you protect yourself from your So we had, uh, we used the uh, disposable trash bags to cover the glove box so that it would not stare directly to the glove box during the experiments. Yeah. You didn't find out Well, so so we I think it was it was a it was an afterthought when we thought about the frequency at, we, at which we were toggling the lines, and I'm like, oh, this is probably it's probably a good idea to just cover this, uh, you know, to knock us. Yeah, good question. Uh, so results. Uh, we were able to get some CFLs to chart to um, some components, the BJT, to be specific, uh, bipolar junction transistor in the in the CFL of Uh In this case, you can see the I don't know if you can see the charring around this region um, in the device. Uh, this plot is from the current detector. Uh, so this is this is the result of one of the experiments we're doing where you know running the signal A on the CFL and we noticed at a particular point that it was about to fail. So what I did in this situation was I disconnected the CFL from the from the dimmer um, and connected it directly to a power outlet and that, that's why you have the spike. But the, the interesting part of it was it actually resulted in a pop. We could hear a pop from the CFL um, and we could see that it was charred at the end of the experiment. And this led us to um, to to take a step back and, and revelate how we were conducting the experiments. So we thought this is how signal D came into existence actually. So we thought how about we introduce random spikes into the signals at you know random times um, and have the normal operation of signal A. And that's what brought about signal D. In the first place, uh, this is some times to, uh, time to failure for for the CFLs. Um, we did a bunch of um, test runs, but this this are the results of the one we actually accurately um, had timings for. Uh, we found out that CFLs either give way. By give way, I mean normal failure where it just it just uh, burns out without any pop or uh, visual uh, or auditory auditory uh, observation. Um, the, by by the pop, I meant I mean by, I mean that you actually hear something and you actually see something um, going in the CFL. Uh, so the time the time to failure. One, one thing I want to point out is it was very inconsistent uh, due to processing design variations. Uh, we found out that for even similar brands of the CFL, uh, it took different times uh, to fail, uh, and we were lucky to get. Well, I wouldn't say lucky, but we were able to get some cell files to fill in like 18 minutes and some to fill in over like seven hours. So the the, the experiments were um, quite interesting when we got a result that, you know, popped, uh, but also painstaking and, and, and the number of hours that we had to watch it sometimes. Uh, the other thing is uh, I have eight, I like to hear the, the Seattle 8 um, showing that, showing that we, uh, the this, the plot I had in the previous slide was basically the result A, um, where we disconnected the CFL from the dimmer and connected it to a direct power outlet. Um, and then we can see that in, in, in for the CFL figure for the lantern, 
uh, we were able to get people up in 1.5 hours um, after, after applying signal V to it. So uh, applied signal effects. Uh, so we, at the, end, at the end of our experiments, we were able to come to a conclusion that signal A was effective in getting the CFL to pop. Uh, so was signal B. Uh, for signal B, we, we, we concluded that it was able to cause seizures at the rate that we were, uh, at the rate at, at which we were toggling it. For mercury, there's no cost-effective way to detect it. Or, or quantify how much was released. So whenever we did our experiments, we made sure that it was enclosed and properly disposed of within the glove box itself. Um, there was no incidence of shattered glass um, during the course of our experiment. Um, and that just summarizes the effects that those signals had on CFLs. So for future work, uh, we definitely want to test with a larger sample size. Uh, would love to investigate with more signal types. Um, like I said, you could play around with a lot of variations, different um, random, different distributions for the random number generator, or different thresholds, or different voltage levels that we were uh, running against. Uh, would also want to know the effect of the experiments on the temperature of the CFL um, and, and, and its surroundings. So one thing that we'd like to point out is even though we did not get, uh, we did not cause a fire, but think of a scenario where you had uh, lamp, lamp shades around, around the CFL that could combust easily um, and cause a fire. Those are things that you can uh, uh, think of. And it's been nice to know what effect our experiments have on temperature. Um, we'd love to detect and quantify among the amount of mercury released. Um, and we'd love to do uh, an end-to-end -end analysis on compromised systems over the internet. So lessons learned. Um, experimentation with cyber school systems can be expensive, uh, time, money, and it requires constant monitoring. Um, when you think of com uh, computer science experiments where you can run simulations overnight and come check your results, we did not have that. We did not have that ability because there was a potential for fire, and we had to monitor it for like as long as seven hours uh, in some cases. Um, it's also very expensive in, 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 in regards to money. Um, think of what and what you need to purchase the setup. You know what what are the safety safety plans and measures you have in place. Uh, failure times of CFLs were highly persistent due to process and design variations, as alluded to earlier. Uh, different. If, even, if, even if you had the same brands of CFLs, uh, the times of failure were largely inconsistent. Uh, those, yes. Due to which process? Are you saying manufacturing process? Manufacturing process. Manufacturing process on, on the device. So, so that's a hypothesis. That's, that's an hypothesis. Because, well, we, we believe we're able to prove that because we're the same, the same brand, right? The, the same. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you don't have you don't have ground truth for why they fail. Well, you don't know whether it was a processing problem or a design problem or what the problem was. So we design we, we, for design problems. We said we bought two different brands of CFLs, right? They had two different designs, and we tested against that. And and they had different times. Of, in fact, if you look looked at the table, um, you notice that one particular brand failed with the pop, and the other did not. Uh, we kind of attribute, attributed that to the design design variation. Um, for the process variation, we had the same brands and they had different filling times. So um, I guess it's an hypothesis, but I think it's an hypothesis. Okay, let's fire it up. Did you have a question? Okay. Um, so I was uh, just. Uh, Wondering, we you're, you're discussing expense here. Is, is it just expensive according to what we normally do in security, or uh, expensive according to what? Because this still seems pretty cheap compared to bio, uh, bio well, related. The usual, the usual people we see doing mm -hmm. lots of business experiments. Well, it's 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 cheap. It's relatively cheap compared to other computer science experiments or or research. You have to buy. We have to buy a bunch of different nodes just to simulate 
the home or deployment in the home. We had to, you know, we had to do other things. Uh, safety measures for one. Um, no lab wanted to to just immediately accept or oh, come to come to experiments that could result in a pop or a fire in my lab. You know, these were things that we had to take into consideration um, while doing this experiment. Yeah. So, how do you think uh, dimmable uh, stem cells would respond to this sort of test? I mean, are they, you know, are there specs kind of like state that they really should fail under the sort of signal? Well, we, we, we didn't try, we didn't try with dimmable signals, but it would be interesting to see um, their effect on them as well. I believe there'll be a region of oppression that you can push them to that may result in a failure. Uh, but I'll be interested to see. Oh. Um, how did you plan to see the effect of the whole? So we we initially showed. Uh, oh, so the question was, how do you plan to stage an attack into the home auto? Yeah, the home automation system. We basically demonstrated that we were able to embed JavaScript code uh, and, and gain access uh, through cross-site scripting attacks uh, to the home automation system. Uh, what we've not done yet, which was not the focus of the paper, was to conduct a full end-to-end -end experimentation with CFLs over the internet, which is something we have to do. Uh, so the last the last point I had was signal B had the potential to to induce seizures due to the rate of fluctuations. We're doing it at a very fast rate, and we had to cover it uh, with uh, with disposable uh, opaque uh, bags to prevent that from happening. And if you if you think about it, it's not really you may you may say it's not really an issue, but if you have if you have uh, someone who's prone to seizures. Um, not expecting CFLs to induce them, um, and an attack against access to their home automation system, you could cause that person to suffer uh, uh, a seizure, uh, either normal or normal. Yeah. Um, did you talk to, have you recorded the security uh, vulnerabilities that you found in the home automation? Yes, we, yes, we did. We, Are they receptive or understanding? We, we've not gotten a response yet, um, but we, we informed them about the vulnerabilities that we found in the system. It seems like with your paper and black hat paper, yeah. that, uh, you know, it's just sort of waiting to happen. I mean, there, there's an ad on TV, which, right. you know, I, I love, you know, with the family and the cat right. and the kids stop by the house and then dad sits there and turns everything on and off. I mean, I have, you know, teenagers and 20 year olds who routinely leave the house in pretty much that state. Right. You know, and I'm like, oh, my husband, like, we need this. Right. <laughs> you know? it, 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 but now, you know, if this becomes, you know, sort of known knowledge, mm -hmm. then that ad plus this kind of paper is sort of, you know, an invitation to the hacker. It's a, it's a very good point you raised. I, I think there is a, so you, you look at the benefits. It has a, a huge convenience factor to it. Uh, but I guess there's a point where you have to step back and reevaluate things from a security perspective and say, is it worth it? Uh, well, it's, it has this huge benefits, but what are the costs I'm giving up in terms of security and privacy? And you can evaluate that and decide whether or not well, to I get mean, it. I want the manufacturer to right. the security holes. It's, it's nice to you know bring this to, to their, to their uh, they, they, should be brought, they should be made aware of this so that it can make it more robust to attacks like this. Uh, and future undiscovered ones. Uh, so, just one comment, I mean, I guess one, you have some system connected to the internet, there is no guarantee right. that you will get um, to a point. Right. All right. Any, uh, was there a question? Somewhere. Okay. So, related work. Um, I pointed out earlier that Flatty and others compromised the Z-Wave protocol stack. Um, Danny and others also demonstrated that the physical system ex um, physical exploits to robots robots used in the homes uh, they were able to you know manipulate them get live feeds from them as well. Um, we and others com compromised this, this this is the work that was done in Colombia. Uh, the compromised printers through a firmware update um, modification, and they were able I think they they claimed that they were able to get the printer to um, char papers. Uh, in their work. Uh, Checo and others demonstrated the compromise of automobiles where they were able to disable brakes remotely. They were able to um, uh, to turn on the lights in the car 
uh, record conversations, eavesdrop on, on conversations in the car. Um, this is some related works in this area. Um, with this, I'd like to thank Professor Carl Boringer for granting us access to his lab. We did all the lab experiments in his lab. Um, Carl Kosher for um, his feedback on, on feedback and help with the experimentation. Um, and other members of the Security and Privacy Research Lab, uh, one sec, Dr. Perry Gates, and the LISA committee, and anonymous, anonymous reviewers for the feedback on this work. Um, with that, I'd like to uh, summarize and say our experiments show that non network appliances like CFLs uh, are vulnerable to uh, remote manipulations by an attacker. And this should be something that people should start taking into consideration, um, especially. Um, Home automation designers, uh, homeowners, and, and researchers. I'd also like to, at this point, open the floor for questions and discussions. Um, I think one thing that comes to mind is: is this possible? Is it possible to obtain similar results with binary switches? Um, uh, from what we found out, um, and feel free to. This is a discussion. Feel free to interject and uh, raise up your concerns. Uh, from what we found that it's possible to do something of this sort with signal B, where we toggle the light switch, the binary switch on and off at a very fast rate. Um, but we've not we've not done we've not done uh, experiments in this this area. Um, I would also want to open up you know just a discussion what other non-network appliances may be vulnerable and what appliances would you like to see studied. Um, if you have a, if you if you have anything, yes. So he didn't work to me. Yeah. Picking up on a comment Greg made earlier, I'd love to see a little bit more work on the physics of the physical side. Okay. Because, you know, we popped it. But what was the physical phenomenon that right. actually wrote? Mm -hmm. And that would then inform what do you mean the you almost need to go backwards. Mm -hmm. What's the physical phenomenon I want? And then how do I use it with the waveform? Rather than trying a bunch of waveforms and seeing if they do something, right? But do the uh, damage assessment and see, well, what you know, was it a transistor that overheated? Was it a junction that broke? Right. Was it the, something in the bulb itself that failed? Right. What's, what's the failure analysis, and then how do I induce it? And that would be a, a much more focused <coughs> experiment, and also much more focused mitigation. Right. Uh, do I mitigate it? In the circuitry in the bulb itself or in the controller, because then we could actually tell them, tell the controllers, don't allow this situation to occur. Right. And even if they get broken into, there may be savers, you know, safeguards <laughs> in the controller about the physical aspects of what it was doing. Because that's, in the end, mm -hmm. the data you have is all about the physical effect rather than the side Right. I, I completely agree. It would take, you know, rebuilding the schematic and analyzing um, what the normal operations are and what the, um, you know, boundaries are, you know, and what we can push it to do. Um, I completely agree with that. Yeah. Um, so there's a potential trivial defense to consider with this attack, too, that might be worth looking at poking holes in. Uh, uh, that is, well, I'll just use LED bulbs and everything. And that those potentially will have some circuitry issues again. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about the mercury, right? Um, and you still have huge power savings. Uh, now, you you could certainly denial of service the individual's budget if you mm -hmm. blow a bunch of their LED bulbs because they're not really cheap. But mm -hmm. uh, the health risks, uh, right. might have, Except for maybe seizures are lower. Okay. Yeah, that that sounds. Uh, we actually considered doing doing some experiments on LED bulbs, but we we didn't get there yet. Uh, we did not get there at the time we published the paper. Your previous yeah. slide lists a bunch of uh, other successful attacks, and your, your discussions might suggest that maybe there's more attacks that uh, could be successful, and maybe all that is true. But what seems missing here to me is the extraction of some kind of scientific Thank you. 
fail. The United Nobles and getting us the core science education. Yeah, I, I completely agree. So, but I think I think when we started out this work, we set out to um, identify. We set out to identify. Uh, uh, factors that may drive the community, the manufacturers, um, you know, uh, homeowners to consider what risks are associated with connecting something that was designed to be contained in the home to the internet, and uh, what manipulations can, you know, what remote manipulations can can bring about, or what results that you can get from a remote attacker's point of view. I, I agree with you on, on the fact that, yes, we need to identify the scientific principles and the physics behind all of this to make it more robust. Um, yes, we, we will get there. Uh, but I think this is an initial work into, oh, these are possible scenarios that you could have with the systems connected to the internet. And how do we go about you know, ensuring the safety of homeowners? Well, if you're looking for something in the form of a product warning, so so to, to follow up on that is this idea of uh, sort of uh, getting to the, uh, not necessarily in my case talking about this grand thread I'm not using physics as the grand thread uh, but I, I, I evangelized on this a couple of years ago at a large industry conference, security conference and the idea is as academics uh, we have a very useful position because we are not reliant upon immediate sources. In some ways, we're not reliant upon the immediate profit line that a lot of organizations and security researchers are reliant on that usually causes them to do just straight attack research. And when we see, I, I think what would be useful as a thread and, and what we have the leniency to do as academics that a lot of the industry security researchers can't do is that when we have studies like this, we don't really have a good framework of judging the risk of these sorts of attacks. So that could also be this nice universal thread as we go through it. Because then, because when we talk about these, we are proving a binary. We're just saying, yes, it is possible to do this. But just saying it is possible to do that does not allow me as an individual to make an educated decision on how to mitigate the attack threat. Uh, because how, what are the costs that am I going to assume protecting my network, educate, you know, the cost of education, money, et cetera, et cetera. And as academics, we can look into that. Uh, and, but uh, the people who usually produce a lot of the attack research just end up doing the binary research because they work for a conservative security consulting firm and doing the binary research is you know, fits in the product cycle, it's great PR, et cetera, et cetera. Right. They just can't look beyond the surface level. They just don't have the time. Okay. So I actually, since we're going to break for lunch here, I just want to make a comment since uh, Richie wasn't in the uh, program committee discussions. I uh, want to share just a little bit about what we saw valuable in this paper and you know, why we thought it was appropriate for this conference. And it really was driven by the methodology. And that's actually uh, why. Uh, Dr. Bates was uh, involved in uh, helping shepherd the, the, the paper to really bring out the notion of what was the methodology. Because the notion is so that it can be reproducible, so that you can do the sort of statistical test to you know, determine whether or not a particular factor uh, is, is, is significant. Uh, but we thought the real contribution was let's, let's nail down the methodology and get that documented through the workshop uh, so that it could be used. And it, so that, that notion of nailing down the document nailing down the methodology then becomes a reference for other people saying, okay, if I want to investigate this area for, for, for the attacks, here's, here's something that I can look at and say, okay, I need to create a methodology like that in order to do an effective evaluation. So I just wanted to add that before, before we yeah. go. No, thank, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, so you know, I wasn't involved in the discussion, but I do think that it's a, oh, because I have the mic, I have to do it. I'll take the opportunity to say that there's a number of directions we can take this conversation. Uh, one of which was just well, how do we think about doing security with physical artifacts like this safely? Um, you know, when we may not a priori actually know the risks. So we knew about explosions, we knew about mercury, you know, we knew about you know, potential fires, but things like seizures, you know, how you know, what what steps does one need to take to understand the thought of everything? Um, so uh, you know, I think we do have a, a few minutes left. So I'm noticing a, you know kind of questions from a few people, but I suspect that lots of people also kind of you know. Uh, might have thoughts about this. So I want to do another group activity. Yes, you, 
Okay, fine. But I'm going to do that anyway. Uh, we're hopefully find someone you haven't talked to yet. Uh, introduce yourself uh, and um, you know come up with you know one idea, some some takeaway message or some direction uh, that you would like to see you know happening in this broader space. A takeaway message, you know, what have you. So you just discuss with someone you haven't discussed with yet. We'll get to everyone eventually. <laughs> Oh, sure. They want. Yeah. So uh, we haven't gotten any questions from folks remotely, but if they want to ask, they can, and we can okay. get someone monitoring their chat session. Oh, great. Okay, and they know that, so they can they can ask. Hopefully, they yeah. do. But okay. So in the you know seven minutes left, I'm not sure exactly. Uh, I know. Yeah. One, one outcome that I found interesting in this is that uh, having watched this paper as we've gone through the uh, through the acceptance procedure, getting up to this point. Was the, was the change in, in tenor from going from this is an interesting result, which is an interesting result, that's, that's what the paper's about, to what kind of higher level uh, abstractions can we start to draw? I think it was you that brought up how, how do we as academics start to say, how do we prevent this kind of thing from happening in the future? And that's the kind of, kind of thinking that we're trying to engender in this whole conference is moving from. Uh, excuse me, I'm not, this is not rhetoric, but cute tricks. So it's, a, it's an interesting, fun result. But the end result is, is what's the science behind it, and how do we change that? And so that's what, when, when uh, Carrie Yates got involved in this, her interest was in trying to make that move through to understand what, how is it preventable, what's the science, how can you predict it, how can you control it, those kinds of things. And so if we're doing that in the course of this paper and the modifications that you guys are working on with Carrie Yates to, before you publish it, then we're doing exactly what we're trying to do, which is to move from interesting results to broadly applicable uh, uh, principles that go under that underlie that result. Thank you. All right, any other questions or comments? Um, yeah. Well, well, so my comment was, uh, you know, you you said uh, you know these kinds of experimentations are very expensive. You listed uh, you know the related work. Right. I mean, kind of following up on what Ed said. I mean. Well, most of the cyber physical kinds of experimentations that are being reported in these conferences, right, are very sort of one-off, very dependent on the conditions and set up in one particular laboratory. And so the question is, you know, leading into our after lunch discussion, you know, how can we make these more repeatable, analyzable, 
you know, where's the trade-off in the range of simulation and emulation to, to real, you know, right. what value can we get by not actually blowing up the light bulb, but like he has said, by bringing in the physics, you know, so we have more theory behind it and more abstraction. So um, very, very good comments. Um, and then I would add to that probably, um, you know, doing so wisely in the sense of, you know, for like the car work, for example, you know, we wanted repeatability. We wanted it to be scientifically valid, but we also didn't want someone off the internet to just download our, the code and start hacking cars. So, um, you know, what's what's the right level of repeatability, scientific? I think these are all very good points. Okay. I, actually, to tie into that, and the fact that you mentioned you gave the vulnerabilities to the manufacturers, some legal implications. When you do that, what what is our level of due diligence that we can then go back as scientists and say, look, we were due diligent. We sent these to the manufacturer. They did not fix them. But because this is a scientific endeavor, we want reproducibility, we have to publish our code. I argue code publishing is a requirement of proper reproducibility. And so at what point can you legally shield yourself from any ramifications? Because while well, you were due diligent in protecting against these bugs, the manufacturer, however, was not and just sat on the reporting of the volumes for who knows how long. That is a good question, uh, and I suspect that the answer might depend on the situation. Yeah. Um, you know, I think another thing of kind of doing our you know job of trying to protect manufacturers that you know is a discussion point is we actually said product A and product B, and we did a point fingers at names, and that was because we didn't want someone to you know we didn't want to facilitate the exploitation of systems. But on the other hand, someone might argue, well, we actually need to know you know which are these particular products we looked at and so on, um, and. Uh, gosh, you know, I think there's also, you know, one needs to consider both, uh, not just, you know, the scientific reproducibility, but, you know, the actual legal implications in, you know, trafficking in attack code, you know, so, um, yeah, I think these are very good questions to consider, um, but yeah, yes. I just want to share, um, I guess my, my view of the future, I, first of all, I love this, because it's, you know, so fun. Um, my background is, my undergrad is in electrical engineering, so I felt really at home here, this was Wonderful, probably you know, one of the you know, most at home presentations I'll have. Um, and I'm also taking courses in the reliability engineering department, my advisors in that department, and this fits you know, squarely in those, those fields. And I just wanted to, to point out um, that there is literature in reliability engineering where okay. you will see models, typically of like a light bulb um, model for what is the time to failure of, a, of a, a light bulb. And it's like the textbook example that they give. Yeah. And so I would encourage you to just, just look at. Uh, what's out there, and you can see how your data fit into that. There's also models for accelerated testing, okay. um, so that you don't have to, you know, wait 18 hours right. in some of these. Um, there's also models for. That'd be nice to have. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and, and, it, and it's out there. I just, yeah, just okay. want to point out to you. Um, there's also uh, models for uh, what they call the uh, sensor data, where okay. it fails, but you don't know when in the time interval it fails. You came back the next morning, right. and it, it was broken. And, and that's, that's, again, out there, there's, there's textbooks on that. Um, we, we have a course uh, at the University of Maryland. It's called The Physics of Failure. And that fits right into to this kind of stuff where you get into the actual device. Um, you mentioned the pop. And now I have to go back to my yeah, undergrad lab days in you know, the electronics lab. And I actually saw, was looking very carefully at the, the picture that you showed of one of the CFLs. And I could recognize uh, like electrolytic capacitor. That's right. a cylindrical mm -hmm. device with like, yeah. blue and black in there. I try to avoid that capacitor around if, if you guys. Um, I'll, I'll pass on that just because of the mercury. <laughs> 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 no, but it was it was sure that we didn't we didn't break the 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 container. Uh, okay, so maybe. it's just the ballast in itself. Maybe then. Maybe. <laughs> um, and and so just to, to bring you some physics on that. Typically, if you're being you know badly behaved in your lab class and you want to make the electrolytic you know, capacitor pop, um, you reverse bias it. Mm -hmm. And um, that'll cause problems. My guess is that wasn't exactly what it was. But mm -hmm. um, there's also the, uh, the the property that the charge on a capacitor is a state variable, mm -hmm. meaning it can't change instantly. And so as soon as you, you showed that plot and it said, oh, we had a surge. Right. And then we heard the pop. Mm -hmm. I thought, oh, that's just that's that's so a electrolytic capacitor just just right. have to do that, you know. So keep keep in mind just to add to that, we we don't we don't have access to the light bulb itself. Well, all we're doing was just remotely, and I think it made it difficult. So you mentioned reversing the polarity on the capacitor. 
um, if we had actual access to it, um, to the to the DMAR, to the CFL, maybe maybe there would have been ways to do that. Uh, but we're doing all of this like remotely, um, and we're assuming that the attacker doesn't have access to this. Thing. I understand. Great. Um, anyway, thank you for letting me add that. I yeah, really thanks. Thank you very yeah. much. One last comment. That kind of extraction that you're talking about is exactly what we're after because what we're trying to get to is let's take ideas like from a CFL study mm -hmm. like what you're doing. Can we extract things that we that we know are vulnerabilities and we can apply them in situations like SATA control, for example, or implantable medical devices? I mean, those are higher risk or higher consequence kinds of things. And so can we learn something in a cheap and, and easily repeatable environment, CFLs, that applies to very high highly critical kinds of applications later on. That's what we're looking for. Right. Thanks. Great. Uh, so let's take a bit.